Café Scientifique is a monthly series of expert-led discussions on science and culture presented by the Bell Museum of Natural History. For more information about the Bell Museum or to find out about upcoming Café Scientifique programs, visit bellmuseum.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Hey everybody, how's it going? Thank you for being here tonight. This is a great crowd. It's lovely to see you all before the big snowstorm hits, I guess, that we're all in, in store for, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of excited about it myself. Um, thank you for joining us at Cafe Scientifique tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Leah Peterson, and I'm the Adult Programs Manager at the Bell Museum of Natural History, which is alive and well, even though our building is closed for the time being. Um, if you want to check on our progress, we have a beautiful brand new building going up on the corner of Larpenter and Cleveland, mm -hmm. and it is very nearly complete from the outside now, um, last I saw. So mm -hmm. I think they were putting on, putting the stuff mm -hmm. on over the building wrap. Yeah, yeah. Small, um, okay. You know, all the beautiful textures of pine and metal, corrugated metal and whatever else they're doing. And um, so it's really something to, to go check out and we will be moving in uh, actually at the, probably at the end of this year and then opening summer of 2018. So just a little update for you. Um, we are going to proceed with our quiz, and then I'll introduce our speaker, okay? Um, so, Aaron, if you would please join us. These are questions related to our topic tonight, which is forest keepers, science, spirituality, and conservation among the Batak tribe, who are from the Philippines. That's the background that you might need to know. All right, so question one. How many islands comprise the Philippines? Option A, 11,300. B, 4,344. C, 7,106. D, technically only about 70. I'm 4,300. B? B? <laughs> I don't know what, te what do you mean by technically? <laughs> Scott? <laughs> um, answer is actually, well, I should say, no, that's not, that is not correct. Okay. Bad. Thank you. C, what was C? 7,106? That is correct. Excellent. Well done. Technically, maybe this is the technically part. Technically, there's 7,107 at low tide. <laughs> All right. Question two. Which of these is a new animal species first discovered by Western science in the Mekong River Valley last year? A, the Klingon Newt, so-called because it looks like Worf from Star Trek. B, a species of beetle named after Stephen Colbert because of its large genitalia. I wish I had read these ahead of time. <laughs> More closely. <laughs> I was like, oh, animal new animal species, yup, yup, that looks good, okay. <laughs> C, the Ziggy Stardust, a lizard with an especially shiny head. D, the world's largest species of dragonfly, species name Oyen Hagis Thompsoni. <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> All right, those are your choices. The Klingon Newt, the Stephen Colbert Beetle, the Ziggy Stardust Lizard, or the, the Oyen Hagis Thompsoni dragonfly mm -hmm. in the orange shirt. Right. Oh, just, yeah. oh. <laughs> See, the Ziggy Stardust? Uh, that is actually not correct. No. Yes, over here. Yeah. Yep, you. Uh, hey. <laughs> A, the Klingon Newt. That is the correct answer. Well, Klingon Newt, Ziggy Stardust, the lizard also does live in the Mekong, but it is a snake, oh, well, and not a lizard. Well, there you go, very tricky. <laughs> All right, three, okay. According to the University of Philippines Ethnographic Museum, how many distinct indigenous tribal groups are there in the Philippines? A, 21, B, 86, C, 112, 
D, technically, <laughs> there are only eight based on linguistic data. B is the correct answer. Well done. B, 86 tribal groups in the Philippines. But some missionary groups put the total at more than 120, and it's 121 at low tide. All right. Should we next? Yep. Number four. Much of the talk tonight concerns citizen activism. Which of these was not a successful petition drive? A, a campaign to outlaw logging in the Philippines' largest province. B, a campaign to outlaw mining in the Philippines' largest province. C, a campaign to name a beetle after Stephen Colbert because of its large genitalia. <laughs> D, a campaign to change the name of the Philippines' national basketball team from the Pepsi All-Stars to the Seven Ups. <laughs> Citizen activism, folks. <laughs> yes. C. No. <laughs> it is not a com campaign. <laughs> no, it's a successful campaign. To rename the band, was that a successful campaign? The Stephen Colbert? Yes. Yes, it was. And is that why it was named that? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. A. That is not correct. Yes. Okay. D. No. <laughs> right there in the purple. <laughs> Mm -hmm. B, that's right. Okay. Good. So the answer is B. Okay. A petition to outlaw mining in the Philippines' largest province. And I think you have something to yeah. add? Oh, I could explain D about renaming the Pepsi All Stars to the Seven Ups. About 20 years ago, PepsiCo in the Philippines had a um, had a contest where where on the back of bottle caps they would you would get a prize of fifty thousand dollars if you got the one winning bottle cap. They accidentally printed about 100 winning bottle caps. And everyone came for the $50,000 prize, and they refused to honor all 100 winners. So the country petitioned to have the name of the basketball team changed from the Pepsi All-Stars to the 7-Ups. Oh. <laughs> there you go. And, oh, and then actually your other note here was about the well-endowed beetle. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sonoma Colberti, which actually lives in the eastern United States. Excellent. All right, number five. Our speaker lived with the Batak, a rainforest group on the Philippine island of Palawan, which did they not regularly record so that he bring them. A, raw tobacco soaked in sugar water. B, sardines in cylindrical cans. C, vegan green Thai hot sauce. Or D, pocket knives with pictures of pinup girls on them. So three of these were regular requests and one was not. Yes. C, that is not correct. <laughs> with a, yes. D, that is correct. Answer is D, yes. <laughs> uh, but no, <laughs> you're looking for the pinup? <laughs> Um, pocket knives with pictures of pinup girls on them. Batak used the paper from the sardine can labels to roll the cigarettes made from the tobacco that has been soaked in sugar, and they love hot sauce. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Let's see. I think we'll just do two more, just because we're... Do you have a, two that need to be read? Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, just because I want to make sure I leave plenty of time for our speaker to get up here, but you gave us such good questions. Question six. Which is an environmental strategy employed by the Batak? A, secretly cutting down sacred trees so the tree's spirit will kill its owner. B, carrying their waste through the forest for days to reach areas rich in wild yams and then using it to fertilize them. C, singing while harvesting grubs to appease and distract vindictive forest spirits. And D, refusing to use plastic bags. Which of these is an environmental strategy employed by the Batak? Yes. B. B. Not correct, but that would have been my guess. <laughs> yes. D. D. That is also not the answer. So we're down to secretly cutting down sacred trees or uh, singing while harvesting grubs. Yes. 
No, it's not C. <laughs> right over here. Hey. Hey. It is A. <laughs> All right, answer is A, secretly cutting down sacred trees so the tree's spirit will kill its owner. If Batak see a landowner mismanaging natural resources, they will find a sacred tree on his land and wait until the tree's spirit is away. They then sneak in and cut it down. When the spirit returns, it will then mistakenly blame the landowner and kill him. They say it always works. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> That's a, a good, maybe 30 years. <laughs> yeah, are, yeah. Um, okay, we're going to do one last question, and then I'm going to introduce our speakers. How do Batak tribes people traditionally handle conflict? A, ritualized warfare, a remnant of headhunting days. B, sending female leaders to act as emissaries. It's better not to involve the men. C, inviting offending leaders to a goodwill meal and then secretly poisoning them. <laughs> D, run away. <laughs> yes, in the purple cardigan. B, that is not correct. John. A, that is not the answer either. Right in the middle there. C, new. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, somebody who hasn't won a prize. Somebody who hasn't won a prize. What was that? D. Oh, yes, it is D. Excellent. All right, so answer is D. Run away. Violent behavior is virtually incomprehensible to the Batak, a very xenophobic people. Traditionally nomadic, when faced with conflict, they simply quietly relocate. And I think that'll have something to do with the story, the bigger picture of the story tonight. The Batak's forest neighbors, on the other hand, the ta oh, Tagbanua, are skilled poisoners. <laughs> All right, I just want to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Scott Dodds is a professional documentary filmmaker with a background in anthropology. For the past 40 years, he has worked with biologists and environmental scientists, documenting research and international development projects. His work has spanned 15 countries and been awarded three Emmys and a Peabody Award. Tonight's presentation concerns 20 years of video documentation of a tribal people in the Philippine rainforest. I would also like to add that in service to his craft, I hear he has danced with possessed witch doctors, <laughs> but who hasn't? Traveled, <laughs> traveled with Afghan mercenaries, and eaten mice, termites, and caterpillars. Excellent. Without further ado, let's bring okay. up Scott Dodds, and okay. I will hand over the okay. microphone. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. Very good. Okay. Go. Hi. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out. I see a lot of friends here, and I appreciate that. Um, I just want to mention I would like to have no questions or comments until uh, we're done with the presentation, because... Uh, it's a, a pretty uh, tight script, and uh, I don't want to get off, off cue here. So, okay. Tropical forest and humans. Rainforest, you only got three of them. You got the Amazon, you got the Congo, you got the Southeast Asian rainforest. Now, you've all heard the statistics. Rainforests cover 4 or 5% of the land surface of the Earth, but they're home to about 50% of all of terrestrial life. Now, the Amazon, of course, gets all the publicity because, first of all, it's big. 2.1 million square miles. Congo, about 1.2 million. And Southeastern Rainforest, 1 to 1.2 million, depending on where you draw the boundaries. Now, we all know rainforests are in trouble, right? I mean, Amazon, we've lost about 20% of it, mostly due to industrial exploitation. The Congo is a little bit harder to measure because most of the incursions are small farmers. These things don't show up on satellite photos or anything, but probably maybe 5% has been lost. Southeast Asia, though, is a different case. In the last 40 years, the Southeast Asian rainforest has been decimated by 40%. It went from 70% total forest cover to 20%. And think about it. 40 years ago, what event could have pre helped precipitate this? The Vietnam War. Okay. Defoliation campaigns by the US Air Force wiped out didn't wipe out, but seriously compromised probably half of the rainforest on the mainland of Southeast Asia. 
The U.S. Air Force defoliation mission's motto is, only you can prevent a forest. (laughs) Southeast Asia is a real driver of species diversity. Although it's only half the size of the Amazon, the rainforests there rival it in terms of the number of species. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. One is that it's a very old rainforest. It's about 100 million years old. Um, unlike the uh, Amazon, which is a mere piker at 55 million years old. Um, Another reason is this is a volcanic area, and being a volcanic area, what you see is a lot of islands, a lot of mountains. This creates divisions, isolated areas where species can develop. And if you read Charles Darwin, or better yet, Alfred Russell Wallace, you'll see that the theories of evolution are based on species developing in isolation. This also gives you a lot of different climatic areas, so species will adapt differently to different environments. In the past 15 years, just on the Southeast Asian mainland, an average of three new species have been discovered every week. And last year, in the Mekong Valley alone, 163 new species were discovered. And just to give you a couple um, random non-specific examples, we have the Klingon Newt. (laughs) And Ziggy Stardust, shiny-headed, but a snake, not a lizard, and, wait for it, the largest spider in the world by diameter, a huntsman spider discovered in a cave in Laos. This was actually discovered in 2001. Of course, there are additional pressures on the rainforest. It's population pressures. As you've probably seen this graphic before, there are more people living inside this circle than outside of this circle. And if you look at it closely, you also notice that most of this is not habitable. Most of it's oceans and, and high mountain plains, so or high mountains. So this gives you an idea of the kind of population pressures that, are, that are, are placed on the resources there. Of course, who really suffers from this are the indigenous peoples. Um, this is not just a human rights issue, and this is what we're going to talk about. It's also an issue about forest conservation because these people are often essential for forest conservation. You've got tropical forest peoples, typically hunter-gatherers and small agriculturalists. These are individuals who, for the most part, have made a conscious decision to maintain their isolation of what we would call mainstream society. For people like this, the Batak, the forest is a place for them, a refuge where they can hope to maintain some cultural integrity. Other groups are not so lucky, like, for example, the Karen on the border of Burma and Thailand. Governments are trying to wipe them out, and this is the last place that they can hide out. There are also other mountain peoples who don't, whose life doesn't involve isolation. They regularly interact with lowlands people. Some of them have even rather developed agriculture. So this is in uh, Sapa, North Vietnam. Uh, this is a rather diminutive woman, Bao, leading me down one of the terraces. These are people who grow goods, collect goods, come down, sell them in the markets. And they're an integral part of the economies both in the highlands and the lowlands. So that's supposed to be that way. Um, (laughs) um, The other issue is government. If you're going to do rainforest conservation, you need governments that are capable of doing this. And the situation in Southeast Asia is not really that great. Okay, Cambodia. Cambodia doesn't have much of a functioning government, but they rely mostly on NGOs. Now, NGO stands for non-governmental organization, non-profits, organizations that work in the civil service and environmental sector. For that reason, there's no real comprehensive plan. So what things get funded, what things get done based on is kind of based on what's appealing to tourists, what's interesting, what's kind of sexy at the time. Um, Laos, forget it. Nothing good coming out of the government there in terms of environment. Vietnam and Thailand, making a pretty conscientious effort, but they're just pressed by the classic problems of too many people and too little resources. And then we come to this topic of our talk tonight, the Philippines. Philippines, as you know, is how many islands? 7,106, 7,107 at low tide. So. Uh, only about the size of Arizona in in terms of total land area. A hundred years ago, the Philippines had 65,000 square miles of contiguous forest. That's down to 5,000 today. They also have 100 million people and one of the 
highest population growth rates in the world. In the last 40 years, their population has grown 400%. And this is in no small part due to the close relationship of the government with the Catholic Church. Um, in terms of the government, rampantly corrupt. There's an expression in international development circles that says, if you're doing business in Thailand, you negotiate above the table. Doing business in Indonesia, you negotiate underneath the table. In the Philippines, it includes the table. <laughs> so, of course, deforestation is not just an issue of losing forests. You know, erosion causes a lot bigger issues, such as flooding, mudslides. Areas that have been denuded of trees are also very susceptible to typhoons, and they just get wiped out. The washout from these areas destroys reefs, so fisheries are compromised. Um, no more hunting, no more foraging, and deforestation almost always leads to an increase in the rat population, and that's um, followed up by generally malnutrition and disease. Now these are essentially human rights issues. When we talk about human rights in the West, we're talking about kind of what they call first generation rights, we're talking about, you know, the right to assemble, the right, uh, you know, for, to petition your government, the right of freedom of speech. But for most of the world, human rights is much more basic. It's just food, land, very simple issues of security, and maybe freedom from disease. And all of these things around the world are tied in with environment. And probably if there's one lesson to take home tonight, it's that human rights and environmentalism are inexorably linked. So see this long skinny island here, Palawan? There. That's your token animation for tonight. So we got that out of the way, so okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is where my work of the last, one of the projects I've worked on the last 20 years has taken place. Palawan is the largest province in the Philippines, and this island is the fifth largest island in the Philippines. It's 280 miles long, 31 miles wide. The southern end is only about 40 miles from Borneo. It's considered the Philippines' last frontier. It's um, the last major area in the Philippines to be settled. It has 1,200 miles of coastline, so if you are living in the Philippines, there's a very good chance that you make a living from the sea. It has unspoiled coastal and forest regions, and it's considered an essential and unique ecoregion. Just to give an example of kind of how essential this area is, the Forest Trust lists Palawan as one of the 15 most endemic ecoregions in the world. Just under half of its virgin rainforest is intact. Um, UNESCO declared it a man and biosphere reserve and three UNESCO World Heritage Sites are on the island. And for you birders here, the World Wildlife Federation named Ursula Island in the south the fourth most important bird sanctuary in the world for maintaining avian diversity. The list goes on, but you get the picture. <laughs> a little housekeeping here. This is the island of Palawan, and you'll hear references to Puerto Princesa or Puerto Princesa City. Uh, this is actually Puerto Princesa City, this whole region. It's, it's kind of a district. It's about 18% of the total area. The capital city is here, and uh, much of this is, is rainforest and lowland farmers. So, that said, this is the city of Puerto Princesa today. And the reason I'm showing you this is, when I first arrived there in 1991, it didn't look like this at all. There were virtually no concrete buildings. There were no private cars. You see those little tricycles running around? That was the main source of uh, public transportation. There were only a dozen of them on the whole island, and they would take you anywhere you wanted to go for three cents. And look how it's changed. If you needed to go along the length of the island, Long Skinny Island, north, south, south to north, there was one Jeep that made the trip every week. It took two or three days, cost four bucks. The population then was about 50,000 in that Puerto Princesa region, and now it's grown to 250,000. So you can get a pretty good idea of what the additional um, um, toll is on the resources. Mm -hmm. 25 years ago, there were only a few small fishing vessels, like four or five small wooden boats in the harbor, and only one passenger ship that made the trip from Manila every two weeks. And today, of course, the harbor is bustling. The market, when I first arrived in 1991, was just like a farmer's market here, just a bunch of stalls, people would come every week and sell their wares, and now this is the market. The size of a couple of high school gymnasiums. People come from all over the region. They come in boats from other islands just to come in and sell their wares. 
at that time, when I first arrived in 1991, things were heating up in terms of a conservation movement in Palawan. Responsible environmental stewardship often comes at a very high price, and working for conservation and human rights can be very dangerous. Over the past 25 years, the Philippines is listed um, as the second, is second only to Iraq as the most dangerous country for journalists. 150 journalists have been killed in the last 15 years, and hundreds of other people who are kind of, you know, not officially journalists, bloggers, radio personalities, people who took up the environmental cause. And the reason I say environmental cause is because most of the people who were killed were working on issues of human rights and environment, and like I said, human rights and environment are linked. The other ones that were killed were working on issues of corruption. What's corruption in the Philippines? It's about money. What's money about? The environment. If there's you know, corruption taking place, it's about access to a fisheries. It's about um, an illegal mining contract. It's about you know, illegally moving logging. So basically everything, violence, corruption, cronyism, everything's come back to the environment. Palawan, in particular at that time, was a very dangerous place for environmentalists. All the lumber concessions on the island were owned by a single family, the Jose Alvarez family, and they were, of course, denuding the island as fast as they could to make as much money as they could. They hauled down $24 million a year, this one family did, which is more than the combined income of everybody who lived in the province, and 24 times the provincial government. They controlled the press, they controlled the police force, they had their own private police force that would harass anyone. They had lawyers that would sue anyone. They issued death threats. Anyone who got in the way of their making profit by destroying the environment was in serious trouble. Now, you're an environmentalist. The government's in league with the corporations, so where do you turn? And the only chance is the private sector, citizen scientists and activists. This is not as hopeless as it seems. Um, this is me, and this is at the office of Haribon Palawan, which I'll be discussing in a minute. Philippines is known around the world for a very active population. They have got some of the best nonprofits in the world, the best non-governmental organizations, NGOs. People are not afraid to face off a very recalcitrant government. It's been estimated that 20% of the people in the Philippines belong or are active in a nonprofit organization or a cooperative. Haribon is the Philippines' most prominent environmental organization. They started about 40 years ago as a bird watching group. They morphed into a science advocacy group. And from there, they um, became an environmental advocacy group, and they've got members all over the islands. Again, when the story starts in 1991, they just opened an office in, in Palawan called Haribon Palawan. Their leader was a guy by the name of Lito Aliswag, who was a lawyer who was determined to stop all the logging on Palawan. There were about a dozen members of um, Haribon Palawan at the time, and they went out with everything they had. They lobbied the government. Um, they confronted provincial authorities. They did things like you know, lock, blo um, block logging roads and anything to slow things down. They did a big publicity push. They were on television. They were on the radio. And the pushback was pretty predictable. A couple activists were killed. Many more were detained. After a month-long investigation, they determined that Haribon Palawan was a wing, a terrorist wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Um, Fourteen of its members were jailed, and Lito went to exile in Thailand. Now, all this action was taking place here in the capital. Meanwhile, I was here, completely oblivious to what was going on. Um, I was living in Saudi Arabia at the time. I flew to Manila. Um, took the, one, the once every two week boat to Puerto Princesa, took another tiny little eight foot wooden boat eight hours down the coast here, hiked a long day in the rainforest to photograph these people. This is a quote unquote Stone Age tribe that was discovered by the outside world in 1978. Um, after a month with them, I walked out of the forest and, you know, you read about in Discovery Channel of these, these horrible rainforests that are just hot and miserable and slippery and bugs are biting you all the time and you go through and the thorns scrape up your body and you're just bloody and it was that kind of a rainforest. <laughs> so, like, you know, I, you know, I just, I and my partner just barely were able to crawl out of the rainforest. It's beautiful because it just opens up right onto this gorgeous beach and I stepped out of the beach and walked up and was immediately arrested. So. <laughs> 
they assumed I was part of Leto's team. Why else would this crazy American be up in the hill with the tribes? Of course, I had no idea this was the reason. So basically, um, yeah, um, spent a couple of nights in jail, escaped, and if you remember, there was that jeepney that made the trip once a week up the island. Well, the constable's wife told me the jeep was coming and left the door open and got the constable drunk the night before. So, <laughs> so, I, so we, we got out before dawn, ran, got the jeep, took the six or eight hour trip over very rough roads, arrived in Puerto Princesa, was promptly arrested again. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, again, no picture here. Um, Leto was a prominent lawyer, and um, he was kind of missed in Palau, and he was, you know, in exile in Thailand, because he was involved in, of course, some profitable land deals for people, and <clears throat> and, uh, and more than a few kind of not so discreet divorces by prominent public officials. So they allowed him to return to Palau as long as he promised not to make any trouble. So after three or four months, Leto came back, and he was surprised because, in his absence. The membership of Harriman Palauan had grown from a dozen to more than 300. And this was a force that Leto effectively mobilized. He started a public education campaign to try to convince the people of Palauan that sustainable development is where their future was, that conservation was important. They had these clandestine meetings with dozens or hundreds of people where they just gave environmental education. They did this in church basements. They did this in secret rainforest camps. It was like a guerrilla environmental movement hiding out. Since they weren't directly confronting authorities, they were largely tolerated. Meanwhile, the National Herbon Office in Manila began a one million name petition drive to have logging outlawed in Palawan. I don't know if they got a million names, but that was certainly their, was their goal. Um, this made the very corrupt senator from the area, Raymond Mitra, who instantly looks just like Santa Claus, um, very nervous. He was very good friends of the Alvarez family. He made a fortune because of this illegal connection. Um, and he had presidential aspirations. He didn't need any more embarrassment from his home province. He, voted, he uh, instituted some draconian legislation to silence all unauthorized meetings and just quash any dissent. Things were looking rough again for Leto and his uh, cadre of, of pirate environmentalists. About that time, provincial elections were held. Pro-environment candidates won by a landslide. They swept the ballot. It was a sweeping mandate. Dr. Angel Alcala, who was a former Haribone board member, became head of the DNR. And less than four months after taking office, he signed Executive Order 45, outlawing all logging on Palawan. They also did things like ban cyanide and dynamite fishing as the city went to great lengths to embrace an environmentally conscientious economy, and this was a grassroots movement. Mm -hmm. Tourism was promoted, and tourism is now, of course, the number one source of income for the province. And this is the Underground River, which is one of the favorite tourist destinations in Palawan. So, <laughs> About this time, Edward Hagedorn became the um, mayor of uh, Puerto Princesa City, and he very much promoted a sustainable agenda for the future of the province. Um, he made the Philippines' first and only sanitary landfill. And a couple times my partner and I were working in the Philippines, and uh, just because of the nature of Philippine hospitality, we would get swept off with a bunch of foreign dignitaries and taken to some you know, very posh um, function. But the first thing they would do is just run you by the sanitary landfill, because that's the first thing they wanted you to see. So, uh, Hagedorn was so popular, he was elected to office three times, although there is a two-term limit for his office. So, you know, <laughs> welcome to politics in the Philippines. <laughs> so. Okay, we got forests, what do you do with them? You're not logging them anymore. The idea is to make a shift to what's called non-timber forest products. These are products that, in theory, can be harvest, harvested profitably and sustainably without harming the rainforest. We're talking about things like honey, um, rattan to make furniture. Almasiga is a big one. Almasiga is a tree resin that's sold for shellac. Um, the problem was that, you know, the remaining heavily forested areas are, are um, high elevation areas, and these are all owned by the government. 
So the government gave concessions to harvest these non-timber forest products to the highest bidder, and of course the highest bidder were corporations. Things didn't go so well because although you could harvest these products sustainably, the corporations didn't do it. They were going in to make the best, fastest profit they could. You know, if you're gonna harvest a huge honeycomb, I mean, the easiest thing to do is just to kill the bees first. You don't have to worry about getting stung. If you're going to tap a tree for sap, you can tap it conscientiously so you get a slow drip for the life of the tree. You can knock a big gouge out of it and just get a bunch of sap right now and then uh, split with your profit and the tree dies. Things were better, but if you walked into an area of the rainforest where the concessioners had been at work, it was obviously really compromised. The other problem was you've got indigenous peoples like the Batak. They live in these areas, but they don't have any legal right to harvest the forest products. And they want to because they're poor. They need the money. The other problem is that as long as they're living on land where other people want the resources, they're going to be harassed. And they were harassed. Concessioners would try to run them off. They'd steal their hunting implements. They'd make fake jails and put them in the jails. And the Batak became so demoralized that they were actually threatened as a people, and many of them committed suicide. Seven years passed before we returned to the Philippines. Uh, these are the Batak. Well, that's not the, that's a dog, but the, the, the Batak are coming. So, um, they're one of three indigenous groups on the Philippines. In 1997, when I started this work, there were about 1,600 of them or 600 of them, sorry. I was working on a grant from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, from the Open Society Institute, George Soros' people, and from the Sundance Institute to make a series of films about not only their traditional life ways, but also about their work with forest conservationists. They're traditionally gatherer hunters. They would stay a few days in one place and then move on to another place, and they could even stay a couple weeks as long as that, so. Notice I call them gatherer hunters because most of the food comes of gathering and not hunting. And it's also, calling them hunting gatherers is also a way of kind of masculinizing you know, their subsistence regimes. It's basically giving the male um, activities prominence. Here, they think they've found something to eat, they think they've found an animal, and uh, they go to investigate. <laughs> <laughs> what they discovered was called a stink bag. <laughs> they also had a lot of fun. Hey, <laughs> So one thing to be aware of is that these people are very xenophobic. They don't like any outsiders. They don't. They hate tourists. If tourists come in, they either run away or they'll just sit down and be as boring as they can until the tourists leave. Um, the only reason I was able to work with them is Haribo and Plowin had a great long-standing relationship with them. They took years to get close to them and that's how I was able to uh, get this kind of great access to them. These individuals have just speared an eel. They make goggles, they carve them from wood, they find pieces of trash glass, put in them and seal them with pitch. They make spear guns from wood and from a um, piece of inner tube. They'll take this uh, eel to uh, their camp, cut it up, roast it on the fire, taste horrible. <laughs> This is Filiberto. He was at the time a gregarious father of two young girls. Um, what they're doing here is building a very rudimentary forest camp. They sometimes go from their you know, permanent camps, three or four day camps, to two week camps, just out for an afternoon excursion. That's what this is. So they would go out for a day, get a bunch of food, um, cook it, make these nice little shelters, and kind of chill until it's time to go back to their primary camp. Mm -hmm. And this is the hall for the day. We've got small crabs, some chubs, some um, 
Yeah, to Volkos. Minnows, just any kind of small thing they can find. There's no more large game on the island. We used to have some small antelopes and some um, wild boar, but they've all been hunted to extinction, so pretty much um, everything they eat is, the biggest thing they probably eat is a squirrel. They take all these delectables, they wrap them in a banana leaf, put them on a fire for 20 minutes, and yum. Now, Batak no longer live in the forest like that full time. They live in villages about half the time, and the other half the time they go out in the kind of forest camps you just saw. There are advantages for them for living in villages. One is that part of their economy is making and selling forest products. They need a place to bring these products to, clean them up, stage them, store them, until they can carry them down to market. They also discovered that they were being continually pushed further and further away from their lands up into the mountains, and if they actually built structures, it was easy for them to hold on to their land. This is Buyong Og. He is the uh, Kapitan of Mangapin village, and he explains. Makali <laughs> Kakabati kami lang yan tulad na ito, magaling kami lang. Ayan mo yung papalin kami. Tila mo nga ni, andang liyak siguro, agaw na dito ang namungkita. All of this has uh, entailed considerable hardship for the Batak, being just constantly having to relocate, especially since they originally lived by the sea. And if you were a hunter-gatherer person, where would you rather live? Um, they were continually pushed further up in the mountains by migrant farmers that came in, and as they moved further up the mountains, their, their adaptive strategies were not, or their survival strategies were not quite as applicable, and they started to go hungry. Um, they talk about a time a generation ago of quote unquote fat batak, of when they lived by the sea and when life was good. At the time this was filmed, this was about 2001, there was only one small group that still lived by the sea and the traditional Batak lifestyle, and of course, they don't, they're no longer there. <laughs> and if you're lucky, fresh sea cucumber. Oh, got into us. Here, Feliberto again has found some honey in a log, and uh, he's showing us how to collect it. Passing with the capi is Parada Omang is shaking me guan. After the harvest, to take a little bit and use it to make a small offering to the forest spirits. Huh. 
Honey is very important to the Batak, both as part of their economy and as part of their spiritual life. See, the Batak believe that human beings are no better or worse than any other creatures who live in the forest, and human beings have no more right to harvest the forest than any other creature. All the resources of the forest are owned by spirits called Panya'on, and Panya'on are very vengeful. They protect the forest assiduously and will kill anyone who's wasteful of the forest. Even laughing at animals can cause a person to fall sick. And for this reason, the Batak are extremely conscientious conservationists. They can name more than 300 indigenous plants and animals in their area, and they can make very detailed maps of uh, collecting areas and things like that. Just as a quick aside, this is the first thing that I filmed when I got to Palawan. This is the Lumbai ceremony, and the Batak believe that uh, the honeybees go away on a migration, and the Lumbai is to bring them back home again, and then to perform a ceremony to kind of excite them to make a lot of extra honey, because the Batak can only have the extra. You know, if they don't get the main base of honey in their belief that the, that the bees need to survive. Um, the problem with the Lumbai is at the time I was working in Northeast India and I needed to fly to Palawan to do this work, and it's hard to tell when the Lumbai is going to start because it depends on the shaman having a dream. Uh, shaman are called Babalians there. And um, I had a kind of a window when this could potentially happen, and my other work was delaying me to where it doesn't look like I was going to make it back in time for the Lumbai ceremony. So I went down out of the mountains, contacted Haribon Palawan, and I said, you know, um, can you talk to the shaman? Major Puno is a shaman, great guy. Can you talk to Major Puno and just find out, is there any way we can at least get an idea when this is gonna take place so I can plan? They said, well, we'll talk to him. A few days later, there was a message waiting for me. He says, yeah, Puno says that's fine. He can uh, wait a few weeks to have the dream, and when he has it, he'll come down and send you a fax. <laughs> 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 this dance is, this mock battle is kind of a celebration of masculinity. Batak believe that it's the male bees who pollinate the flower, and they want to kind of send this testosterone-laced energy throughout the universe to kind of incite the bees to work harder and make a lot of extra time. This is Major Puno, the Babalian, or shaman, who sent me the facts. Um, at night, he undergoes spiritual possession from the spirits of the honeybees, and they take him flying over the forest to show him which um, hives are safe for them to harvest. Oh, my, my. 
The last bit was a little artistic indulgence on my part, so thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, thanks. <laughs> I just wanted to give a shout out. The gentleman, if you remember, uh, talking to Major Puno, doing the interview with a guy named Ben Logan, who worked for her on Plow, and they dispatched him to me for uh, a year working with the Batak and the Rainforest, and he was just fabulous. He's more responsible than anyone for the success of this film. Honey is also important as a commercial crop for the Batak. Batak elders get together and they do a survey of all the honeycombs in the area and decide which ones are, are safe and they can harvest conscientiously. The people who see them first get, uh, you know, um, first dibs on them, essentially. Feliberto's cutting this, this, uh, this honeycomb down and uh, he'll sell it in the lowlands but not until he's cut it up and made a treat for the neighborhood children of uh, honeycomb with the bee larva still inside. Oh. <laughs> mm. yeah. It's actually good, I, I ate it, it's good. The, the maggots give Ken nice and nice flavor. So, yeah. The Batak also harvest rattan, is what you see here, uh, for sale in the lowlands. They like to harvest rattan because it's kind of easy work, it's close to their homes, they can go out and do it in a day trip. <laughs> then haul it back to their village and they cut it to specific lengths and clean it up for sale in the lowlands. This is the harvesting of almasiga. They actually uh, chop the resin off after it's, uh, after it's hardened. Um, they don't like harvesting almasiga. The almasiga groves are several days voyage away, definitely away from their family for weeks at a time. It's hot, sticky, miserable work. It also puts them in conflict with the lowlanders, whom they call Christianos. Batak are always poor, and for that reason, they often have to borrow money from the lowlanders, and they pay them back with labor. Um, Interest rates often run as high as 500%. As poor people, they have little withholding power and just have no room to negotiate or look out for their interests. Pag <laughs> Saradun, ay mga mata, inunwasan, mga tawag, apa siya rapirin yung pag-uranun. Ito na kuya, gulag ka itong intermission, talaga nga ito na barita. Kaya ba, magsakol ka at bagtik. Bilisan ka pati buwat. Ano man kami, talaga pagpasuman yan, mga kristyanos man ang ubos. Puro patad-tad na kanira, itpataping. Kung ang magpangyari, sumang dakol na bagtik ka itong ba. Patay na. Ito na siya, hindi ang siya. Ay siyempre, maski sikal na itong mga tao. Pag basta-basta ito kami siya, Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
This is Timor. He found an old rifle in the river and he dug it out and was trying to get it working again. So, this is uh, the village of Calabayog, one of the more remote villages. I spent a lot of time here. Um, this is my house in the background here, where I stayed in one of the shifting forest camps for a while. Um, so this is the situation. The Baltak have lived on Palawan for, it looks like about 1,500 years based on records from early Chinese traders. They live in poverty primarily because they were displaced from their primary gathering grounds by the sea. They have no land rights. They can't legally harvest the products of the forest, although they live there, you know, if it's their indigenous lands. And the Batak are the ones who can harvest sustainably while the people who are getting the money for harvesting don't harvest sustainably. And that's the whole thing in a nutshell. This is Professor James Ader at Arizona State University, worked with me on the project, and um, he confirms this. It was really a treat for me to return to Manga Ping after uh, 14 years and to see um, you know, what had changed and what had remained the same. And one of the most uh, striking and, and welcome things visually for me was to see that the surrounding forest was still virtually intact. I had this feeling that I was just like yesterday or last year that I had been there. What this says to me is that the Batak are still able to exploit and to use these resources on a sustainable basis and not abuse these resources. If lowlanders had come in here, uh, as they have in other rallies in other areas that would all be deforested by now. Okay, so once again, uh, enter Haribo and Palawan. Then covered an obscure law called the Certificates of Stewardship Contract Law, which gave renewable contracts of 25 years to indigenous peoples to have exclusive rights to harvest the resources on their lands. Uh, the requirements were really stiff. I mean, they had to meet with the Batak, get their permission, Help them make detailed maps of the area. These are the Batak drawn maps of where the resources are. And do a major petition to the government to try to get them rights to their land. The Batak, normally reclusive, came down from the mountains and all got together and formed a Batak Federation, had their first meeting. Here they are submitting the proposal. This is the first time most of these people have ever held a pen. That's Major Puno right there on the <laughs> And um, the upshot is that it worked. They were granted the first CSC contract. These laws were on the books for a long time. They were kind of good-natured laws that people put in to get some publicity, but no one thought they would ever be availed of, and Herbo and Plowen did it. Progress has been slow, but since then there have been um, a couple of additional CSCs awarded to the Batak and another one awarded to a Tagbanoa group that was doing seaside um, foraging in the north of the island. So, what do you want to take away from this? A couple of things. Human rights and environment are inexorably linked. Citizen activist campaigns can work. Also, poor people do protect the resources. I mean, the conventional knowledge is that, you know, poor people cannot be trusted to protect resources because they simply don't have any withholding power. They need to go back and just grab everything they can for the day's survival, but that's not true. They will compromise their short-term survival looking out for their children. They will not eat the seed potato. The role of NGOs in this kind of development is essential. I mean, the Batak could not have done this by themselves. Um, also, locally driven development projects work the best. There is kind of, the typical development model is to kind of like have large institutions, large governments impose things from the top. I mean, the expression is that 
foreign aid is taking money from the poor people of a rich country and giving it to the rich people of a poor country. So, um, people like one size, one fits all solutions, but that's not the way it's going to work. If we want to make progress, it's going to be small, locally generated projects. These things are also sustainable. It's not a situation where large development agent comes in, give their people jobs for five or six years, set up something with a lot of um, unsustainable infrastructure, and then they take off. I mean, there's also an expression in international development, which is, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Give him a fishing pole, it breaks down, he can't get parts. <laughs> and combined conservation and livelihood programs are essential and um, often requested. This is for Leah. She wanted this to be scientific, so nothing says science like a pie chart. So, so <laughs> this is work that I did with my partner, Helen. Um, she, um, I worked there for a few years, and we went back together to work on her PhD, uh, which was um, looked at basically strategies people use to address their rights, uh, their rights needs in the face of a recalcitrant government. Now, what I want to point out is that we simply asked them, um, first of all, we asked them, you know, who should assure your rights? Governments. Who does? Not the government. NGOs assure our rights. And of all the NGOs, which are the ones that helped you the most? Okay, and which do you want to see more of? Okay, everyone knows about microloans. Got a lot of publicity, you know. Okay, microloans, 5%. Microloans are taking groups of people, giving them some money, have them start a business, which is fine, but you're moving them out of their local indigenous economy, and it's a way of working them into kind of the new do kind of neoliberal capitalist economy in a very subtle way. Um, and it removes them from the local systems of support. But the vast majority of people, and we and our research team interviewed hundreds of people all over Palawan in the cities and the rural areas, poor farmers and the indigenous communities, 60% said that they wanted conservation and livelihood programs. Programs that would help them make a living and preserve the environment. And this definition, conservation livelihood, is not one that we came up on in our surveys when we asked them about them individually. It's a grouping that they made. The Batak, how are they doing today? Um, I've gone back repeatedly over the years. Uh, the last time was three years ago. I hope to go back again this year. You know, they had a large population decline from the hardship of their continual relocation. What that meant is that they were forced into outgroup marriages, mostly to Christians. And what, what happened is they found that if Batak marry other people, it's the Batak cultural traditions that are not carried forward. So, there seems to be two paths that the Batak can take. This is the village of Timboan. This is a, a Batak group there that came down from the mountains. And here uh, they're involved in craft work. They're making baskets which are gonna hold jars that hold honey. This is Doming, he works for Herbert and Plow, and a friend of mine who's showing them how to be involved in the market economy. They're pretty much acculturated, even performing agriculture. Um, they uh, totally abandoned their mountain lifestyle. The other option for the Batak seems to be what the majority of them are facing is staying up in the hills, um, joining with other indigenous groups, and just kind of becoming, losing basically most of their traditions. It's, uh, there's basically a large kind of mass of nondescript tribal people living up in the mountains that have um, you know, no real strong cultural identity. And that seems the way that most of them are going. Now, um, you know, what seems to be happening is they're surviving better as individuals, but their culture is not surviving. And what has happened is basically they've gone from desperately poor to very poor, which is a big stride and maybe is all that may be possible given the resources and the economic constraints around them. So I guess there's one way to look at this. You can say like, well, the CSC programs, did they fail? Were they not a good idea? But one thing you have to understand is that in trying to maintain these people's rights or anyone's rights, you're shooting at a moving target. I mean, you know, they set up the CSCs, but still the rate of uh, in migration still increased, the rate of decimation of forest resources still increased, and um, yeah, you just you, it's difficult to keep up. I talked to James Ader, the anthropologist, a few weeks ago, and I said, any news from Palau? And he said, well, one very curious thing happened. He said, there was a survey there recently, and he said 1,900 people on the island identified as Batak. 
And of course, when, you know, it's always the Batak population, it's only been about five or 600. And he said, I have no way to account for this. He said, is it a mistake? Or is it that that many Batak have married outside of their groups, had children of mixed parentage, who although they didn't carry the Batak tradition forward, still self-identified as Bataks? I don't know. I think potentially we'll uh, find that out this summer, I hope. Um, how's Palawan doing? Well, it's rough. The events of 1991, remember when Lito and his cadre of, of crazy environmentalists knocked back the uh, logging interests? Well, um, the same thing's being repeated now with mining. Um, there's mineral, nickel, copper, and gold on Palo, and people want to get their hands on it. The previous president of the Philippines, Gloria Arroyo, who uh, left office in 2010, had big money tied up with the mining industry, and she was pushing for mining on Palawan. Um, Palawan has a sustainable development council that has to approve all development proposals. And um, in the last few years of her presidency, they got 100 applications for mining permits. Um, the PCSD um, granted, under intense pressure from Manila, seven of them. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources then turned down the permits they needed to deforest the area first, using research provided by Haribon Palawan. <laughs> um, logging has been outlawed in two districts, Puerto <laughs> Princesa and Brooks Point to the south. And, uh, but there are large mines going right now, despite all this. Um, the assault on environmentalists continues. Two radio journalists uh, who were environmental advocates have been killed in about the last 10 years. One, uh, a friend of mine, Jerry Ortega, uh, was a beloved veterinarian who also ran a crocodile farm there. Um, and they were, they were both gunned down. So I guess one way you could look at it is, you know, I mean, is what Leto and his friends did 25 years, was this not successful? Because we're kind of back where we started. And, well, the province is still regarded as uniquely environmentally friendly. It's a rallying point for resistance. But the thing is, they didn't win a single battle. They set up a dynamic. They set up a process. Life on Palawan now is what Leto experienced all the time. It's constant vigilance. It's constant flying in the face of authority. It's constantly pushing back. Constantly putting yourself in danger for the environment, and the point is that is the new normal, and that's how it's going to stay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. That was fascinating. Um, I'd love to take questions if folks have them, and I'd, I'm going to come around with the microphone uh, to try to get your voice on our podcast. So, anybody have a question for Scott about his travels, other projects, the Batak? So, right over here. Hi. Hello. Uh, I was wondering, they have the religious belief that if they defile the forest, they will suffer repercussions. Mm -hmm. Do you know what leads them to that belief or what reinforces it? Do they see, they talked about the Christianos getting rained on, is there empirical? Yeah, well, they say, yeah, and, and they, they say they see it. They say, you know, if we um, abuse the forest, or we say our people get sick and die. And like we said in the initial um, question and answer period, you know, if they don't like a landowner, you know, there's a tree called the Belete tree. And there is a um, panier named Bai Bai <laughs> that lives only in Belete trees. There's a landowner they don't like, you know, they'll sneak in when they think the spirit's not looking, cut the tree down, run away, and then the assumption is that the, um, the spirit will mistakenly blame the landowner and kill him. The, uh, the spirits they have are kind of more like Greek gods. They've got, you know, a lot of power, but they have kind of human foibles, and they all have marriages, and they have got these complex histories and little affairs, and, you know, but the Batak are genuinely very afraid of them. Is this a reality? I don't know. I mean, how much of what any of us believes is a reality and how much are things that we construct to make our world work for us? Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your work in West Africa? Oh, well, um, yeah, um, I did a couple projects in West Africa. My first big film um, was um, way back in 1981. There was a project among the Bono people who live in Ghana. and. Um, the issue is traditional healers in Ghana. And um, 
It was a project that, well, maybe, let me uh, think about this for a second. <coughs> the Bono believe in spirits of the forest, and the, the show is about medicine. The um, medicine men of the Bono would get possessed by spirits, and then under possession, they would be led by the spirits to get medicinal plants to treat people. Also under these just completely racking spiritual possessions, they could go out and they could find people who were deviant in the village and bring them in to be punished. Now the problem in Ghana was in like a lot of other places where um, you know, there just isn't enough health care. So actually a Catholic mission working with USAID came with a program to train indigenous healers to work with Western doctors. And that was what that first film was about. So what happened is the Western doctors found out there were a lot of things traditional healers could treat really well, like broken bones and, of course, psychological diseases. And traditional healers and Western doctors were referring people back and forth to one another. And that's a successful program that was going on to this day. Um, I'm going to embarrass Tom Wallace who's sitting here. <laughs> he he uh, was my partner in that filmmaking. He's been a good friend and essential partner ever since. And that was a, a very successful film. That film um, to, was... Uh, the only film up to that time to be shown at the Margaret Mead Film Festival twice. And yeah, and the, and the film's done very well. It's been kind of uh, probably my most prominent work and probably um, has sort of become um, a standard in development circles about the use of indigenous knowledge um, to further um, you know, goals about health care. Okay. Hmm? Great, there's a question right over here. Name of the film, and can I get it on Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you cannot. Um, you know, I primarily make films for the educational market, and also to be distributed to um, international development organizations. You know, it seems like every film worker's ultimate vindication will be a big PBS broadcast or something like that, and I've had a few of those, but. I actually really like the educational market. I mean, the film that you know Tom and I made in 1981 in Ghana, I mean, it's still being used. I still get, get letters from people who like it. <clears throat> we still get small royalty checks, um, you know, <laughs> which is not the case for, um, you know, yeah, you know. And you know, broadcast, television broadcast is great, but to me it, it's great, you get this ego boost, and it just kind of disappears into the ether. I also like this kind of film because I can do what I please. You know, if you're going to go for a major market, um, you know, you kind of have to make something to fit their constraints. And, uh, um, and I have worked for Discovery Channel. I did a big project in the Himalaya a few years ago with um, National Geographic and, quite frankly, just got tired of getting ripped off by them. So, yeah. <laughs> so this gives me both autonomy and the opportunity to make films that I think do actually make a difference, even if they don't get such a high profile. Great. I'm going to pass the microphone down here. That's a great talk. That's really, really interesting. Can you comment a little bit about how these really different people deal with illness and death culturally? Hmm? Do you have any sense of that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, the Batak are kind of unique in that they do actually believe that illnesses only have a spiritual cause. And most tribal people, like again, the people who work in the West Africa, divide diseases into two categories. One category is diseases that have natural causes. The other is diseases that are caused by spirits. The Batak, they're all caused by spirits. And I don't remember if you remember the um, Major Puno um, in the possession ceremony, those nighttime possession ceremonies where people will bring you know, their ill to be healed by the Babayan, the shaman, when he's under possession. So um, the Batak do actually bury their dead now. They didn't used to. They used to actually leave them on top of the ground, but they get a faced pressure from the government and things like that. Um, they do not have the belief in an abiding spirit after death. And this is part of their sort of modest opinion or perception of people's place in the universe. You know, we believe that we have eternal souls, believe animals don't. That puts us on a higher plane than animals. Batak don't believe they're on a higher plane than animals. So they believe basically when they're dead, it's done because that's what they believe about animals. Ironically, they also are kind of an animist people. They believe in spirits everywhere, that everything is essentially alive. What makes living beings um, kind of unique is that we have mortality, or the spiritual world doesn't have mortality. Excellent job. Thanks. And I mean this question with every due respect. Is there a point, do you let your subjects 
tell you you've intruded enough, go home now? Oh, or yeah. Or do you decide for yourself when it's time to, to step back? No, no, you know, that's a very good question. Um, like I said, I was only able to go in there because of the work of Haribo and Palawan. I went up there with Haribo and people first, and we sat down with the Batak. These are people the Batak trust, and I said, can we make this film? Is this okay? And we had an agreement with people. We talked to different villages. Mangapin, where Falberto was from, a very progressive. They kind of want to interact with the world. They were very interested. Kalabayog, not so interested. Very remote, very traditional people. We had an agreement with everyone that if I walked up with the camera and they didn't want to be filmed, they just had to look away and put their hand up and I wouldn't film them. So I didn't film anyone. We had a, a system of tacit permission. And, um, and of course, Manga Pinos are always behind this effort. I mean, they saw this potentially as, as helping them. And so, yeah, that's generally the way that I approach situations like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go right here, and then I'll head right up to you, OK? I'm curious about what of their beliefs rubbed off on you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> I think um, there are any specific spiritual beliefs, but when you live with a people like this for a long time, and this sounds corny, but it's really true, there's kind of a camaraderie that you feel. You know, the distance between us as first worlders and them as impoverished mountain people kind of disappears, you know, and they, after a short time, were really gracious and allowed me into their ceremonies and <laughs> unfortunately let me eat their food, you know, which is, <laughs> which is a big move on their parts. Um, basically, I guess, I, I have a confess, you know, I'm an anthropologist at heart, I'm a little bit dispassionate. I tend to look at these things probably from the outside a little more than I should, which may be essential to my work. So, um, I seem to have a little more of a universalistic, universalistic view of, you know, basically of all spiritual traditions as having some validity, you know, and that none is being preeminent, and this sort of kind of plays into that whole kind of philosophy. So that might be a cop out, but that's what I got. So. You know. <laughs> uh, I'm right here with. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, passing the mic over. Who was asking the questions to to the people? Oh yeah. That was, uh, there are a couple people, these are all people who worked for the nonprofit Haribo and Palawan. So, like I said, the gentleman who I gave a shout out to, Ben Logan, um, he was um, he, just my right hand man with me constantly. A couple other people, um, um, Joel Taylor, um, Jinky Juarez, uh, their staff was, they were very gracious and very helpful for me. Yeah. Um, the Batak, of course, speak the Batak language, they speak a couple other local tribal languages. They also, most of them speak Tagalog. Now, Tagalog is the primary language of the Philippines that's spoken around Manila. And in the last 30 years, see, the Philippines is divided into language regions. And of course, Tagalog is a language region around um, Manila, and Palawan is a Cuyonan language region. So many people have, have migrated from Manila to Puerto Princesa that Palawan is now considered a Tagalog language region. So even the Batak speak Tagalog. I speak a passable Tagalog, so I could make my way around the culture reasonably well, but I didn't really have the depth to ask questions well. And a lot of these questions are asked in Kuyonan or Batak. And Ben, and you, you saw the questions. They were wonderful. They knew exactly what we wanted to do. And I didn't have to even prompt them. They totally got it. They just were just fabulous people to work with, yeah. Um, I have kind of a two-part question for you. Uh, so I'm curious about whether you brought in any influences to the communities that you were in that you that you know are like legacies now, like a taste for something in particular, or you know, um, yeah. and then also uh, was there any sense of like a, a mutual curiosity? I guess they're they're kind of tied in together. Then, sure. but you know, you're there asking so many questions, and and how you know how many questions were asked of you, and what were they? <laughs> Yeah, no, the, um, the man I worked with, primarily from Haribo and Palawan, his wife ran a Thai restaurant, so guess what? Vegan green Thai hot sauce <laughs> just flooded the Batak villages, and they were down there. <laughs> we'd, we'd bring up, their, their food is so unpalatable to us that we'd bring this hot sauce that's a slather with so we could eat it, and they got a taste of it, and it was all over. Um, <laughs> 
Um, and, and we also would bring food with us, you know, and we would cook meals for them. Um, when we weren't living, in, and remember the Batak live about half the time in settled villages, about half the time in the forest, and Herbal and Palau and, and the villages that they worked had made little, very rudimentary houses for their staff to stay in, and that's where we would stay. We would cook our meals, we'd always make a lot extra and then invite the Batak to eat with us. So yeah, um, in terms of curiosity about us, virtually not. And this is kind of part of the Batak's general xenophobia. They only like to be with their own people. They don't aren't really interested in any other cultures, you know. And like I said, uh, strangers come, they run into the forest. So yeah, they're um, they're very shy people. If you think about kind of the classic idea of the stereotype of the noble savage, you know, people who are very nonviolent, very peaceful. I mean, that's really the Batak. Yeah. Thank you. Question right over here. What are some of the health issues? Um, yeah, tuberculosis was a big problem, um, basically um, malnutrition. Um, there are infectious diseases up there that people in the West don't even know about. Virulent strains of malaria. If you remember when the first pictures I was working with the Tao and Batu people on the other side of the island, in, uh, when I first worked there in 1991, when I left that area, the next group of journalists, uh, two guys died from cerebral malaria in the region I had just been in weeks before. So, of course, malaria is a constant problem. Um, you know, they don't have this sort of resistance to, this, uh, to malaria that a lot of African people do. And, um, yeah. Um, but the big thing basically is just malnutrition. But really, James Ader's research, and this is kind of important, was unique and that he looked at why the Batak were failing and other studies of tribal people who have been compromised by civilization, you know, look at land use and food. And he said basically the people, the Batak, were just so demoralized, you know, by the process that they were just so depressed they couldn't do anything. You know, and they would often kind of have a sour grapes attitude about life. For example, um, Batak liked to have little farms, you know, and um, they just plant a little bit of rice or something like that. Whenever they plant a, um, plant a, a rice plot, usually a lowlander would come and take it away. So people would survey the Batak and they said, well, we didn't like to farm anyway. Well, they totally liked to farm, but it was just kind of, you know, their way of resigning themselves. And so much of the research, and this is what leads to the kind of a talk to the end, which seems to be the end game for many Batak, is just being a group of kind of nondescript tribal people without any real distinct identity kind of living in mass because they just simply, you know, don't have, living as isolated people, they haven't had to develop an ego structure to deal with outsiders. And when they're faced with those kind of pressures, they just kind of collapse. Uh, I think two more questions. Is, do you have, is yours a follow-up to your... Okay, I'm going to go up here, and then I'll come over here. Uh, you had mentioned that people in the Pataki, they're split to stay uh, in the mountains or they go down and, and join the lowlanders. Is there anything particular that sends people one way or another? Um, they say marriage is part of it, outgroup marriage, depends on who they marry. Um, and also, yeah, there are some Bata groups, you know, just um, the different, there were at that time about eight different villages and they just, each one had a very distinct character. Like I said, um, Mangapin, where Felberto was, uh, where they lived in the mountains, but you know, they lived only about a four hour walk from the road, you know, and they could carry their four products down four hours away. They would go into town, you know, um, um, you know and um, you know, sell their goods. So they had kind of a very visible presence. And then you got, you know, they, and they have other groups like um, Kalabayog, Tanabog, way up the mountains, you know, a, a 15 hour walk to the road, and you know, and they just don't want anything to do with anybody. So I don't know what it is that caused them to develop these kind of distinct characters, but it probably is an issue about in Batak traditional life ways when they lived in the forest, you know, they'd live in a large group and if they had any dispute, the group which, you know, didn't like what's going on would just kind of quietly move away. What happens is, as a result of this, you kind of end with conglomerations of like-minded groups. And so some groups are more conservative, others are more progressive, and so it kind of balances out, so you, you just generally have like-minded people. And it's done with no rancor, it's done with no conflict, it's just kind of general ways of the ebb and flow of the evolution of their society. A lot of it is happenstance. Um, the village you saw at the end, Tim Bowen, where the people were, the Batak were kind of modern, modern for the Philippines, agriculturalists, 
they just happened to live in a fairly wealthy area close to the shore anyway. So it's just kind of a little nudge to put them there. Whereas, you know, for people in Kaiabog and Tanabog, it's not a nudge. I mean, you just, you know, it would be a heck of a push and it's just not gonna happen. Yeah. Another question right up here. I'm wondering how many civilizations there are like this that are more traditional. Do we have any sense of that? In the world or in that? <laughs> I don't I know. know. I mean, yeah. Does anybody track that? I'm sure they have, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, yeah, sure, yeah. Oh, question right over here? No, no, not Steve. <laughs> it's an equipment question. Oh, no. How, how did you keep your cameras running? Oh. <laughs> how did you charge batteries? Oh, a couple things, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, built, um, I built lithium battery packs. You could buy basically lithium D cells, and they were expensive, like 40 bucks a piece. I could strap three of those together, and it would run a, uh, you know, a, a video camera at the time it was a DV cam for about 20 hours. You know, they were expensive, but I would just buy, you know, the, the problem was their little hand grenades are incredibly explosive, but you have to be careful with them. But yeah, so that was what I did. And I'd been actually making those kind of, you know, for uh, adventure filmmakers who were working all over the world, they come to me and I was kind of specialized in making these lithium battery packs. This was, um, you know, 20, 25 years ago when, as you recall, back then you didn't go buy a lithium battery for your DSLR. They were all NICADs or nickel hydride batteries. So yeah, so um, yeah, I basically bought the raw cells down at Battery Specialty, soldered them together. Hopefully did it right, didn't have any explode on me. And uh, <laughs> I never heard that any cameraman in the Himalayas when he had the side of their head blown off by the batteries, but yeah. But yeah, that's what we did, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent, any last questions? Oh, right up here. Given the scope of your work and all of the different civilizations that you've um, spent time with, do you feel like these tribal peoples, do you feel like they're going to have a place in the world in the next 20, 30, 100 years? Or do you feel like they're unfortunately going to fall prey to a lot of the industrial issues that you found with um, the Batak people? Um, I'm not optimistic. Let's leave it at that. Okay. 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 Well, <laughs> do I dare give you the microphone? No. Okay. No, don't, don't. Give him the microphone. What the heck? <laughs> That's just my son. Here, yeah. Yeah. I have a feeling. <laughs> and, yeah. um, I just want to let you know our next cafe, we are just working out the details. But it, it really dovetails nicely with this topic. Um, it's going to be with Lisa Aston Philander, who is the curator of the College of Biological Sciences um, Conservatory of Plants. And she did much of her work in South Africa. And uh, we're going to be talking about medicinal plants and her experience with that. So it just kind of ties in so nicely. Uh, thank you so much to Scott tonight. It was a pleasure having you. And thanks to you all for being here. Hope we'll see you next one.